So let me ask you, how was your week? All right, let me tell you about my week. <laughs> Last Sunday afternoon, my wife and I were heading off to uh, a 25th wedding anniversary party for friends. We got on the turnpike and my wife's phone rang and it was her half-sister from Maine. And she called to let Fritzy know that her father had been taken to the hospital and was unresponsive and they weren't sure if he had had another stroke. His blood pressure is regularly in the 200s over something and he doesn't take his medication. And he's a stubborn old man. We have none of those in this church. But, um, so while we were going our way to the party, we were talking to one another, well, if this is as serious as it sounds, what are we going to do? And so by the time we got to the place where the wedding anniversary party was being held, my wife started working the phones, which only she can do so well, uh, calling the family to find out how things were going up in Maine, but also family here to get on to look for flights to uh, uh, Portland or uh, Bangalore, I think. So uh, by the time the festivities had started to wind down, we had decided that if we were going to Maine, we were going to drive the flights one way. It's like $500 one way per ticket to go if you're making a last minute uh, booking. Um, so by 7 o'clock Sunday evening, we we're dropping Lee off at neighbors and telling Steve he had to take care of the cats and we were getting in the car to drive to Maine. And so we drove all night, uh, got to Maine about 4.30, got to Portland. They had taken uh, her father to Portland by that time. Um, got there at 4.30 in the morning, fueled by a lot of coffee. And uh, once we got the lay of the land there in the Maine Medical Center, uh, we spent the next three or four days um, getting a mix of bedside reports, experiencing family squabbles, uh, nasty voicemails, misinformation, and, and a lot of uncomfortable situations. Uh, you see, my, my wife's family, the, the main faction, uh, they, there are a couple of people that are just the bubble off center. French fries short of a half, you, you know what I'm going to say. So uh, uh, by the time we left Maine, Friday, Thursday, uh, we got back really late Friday, early, early Friday morning. Uh, we were just one step ahead of the crazy train coming into the station. Uh, but let me give you a little bit of backstory about my wife. She was, she was born in Vermont on April 17th, that's the that's the same day that Martin Luther stood at the Diet of Worms in 1521. You all should know this, right? You're all nodding your heads. Of course he did. Um, the Diet of Worms, April 17th, was asked to recant for his writings. He said, hey, give me a day to think about it. In the 18th, he went back and famously said, I cannot recant, right? So anyway, uh, a couple of weeks after she was born, her mother gave her up for adoption. Her mother went back to Boston. Her father, the birth father, went off to Vietnam not knowing that he had a daughter. Uh, the adoptive family moved to Camp Hill, and uh, her birth, uh, well, things kind of went along uh, quite well until she was about um, 20, I don't know, how, how old were you when you got married? 22, I think. And uh, she, uh, she married the man of her dreams, or... <laughs> Or nightmare, it's, it's uh, depending on your perspective. And, and, um, and then, after a couple of years of debating about children, she decided to try to find a birth parents. And so, over the next couple of years, uh, miraculously, she was able to find not only her birth mother, but her birth father. And when she met her birth mother, she found out uh, she had two half brothers uh, living in Canada, and she found her birth father, she found out she had four uh, half brothers or sisters that lived throughout Maine and that territory, and maybe a fifth no one knows about. Um, but she didn't grow up with her siblings in Maine. Right? Uh, but she's been trying to establish some kind of a relationship with them. So, now that you know the backstory, and you know that we went up there to, uh, to try to, you know, thinking this was the end for her birth father, what, 
what did I learn from my trip north this week? What did I learn? Well, I learned that no good deed goes unpunished, right? That, that's, that's a truism. I learned that family dynamics can be especially difficult when it involves greed and money and distrust and jealousy. I learned that, of course, my wife and I will do anything for family, uh, no matter the situation. And I learned that it is always hard to keep an open mind when things are happening all around you when you're hated just for existing. Now, we know, and we knew going into this trip that the relationships among the extended family there are iffy at best. So when we go to visit, our emotions are usually flowing back and forth from fear and confusion, but mostly fear. The gospel lesson that we have for today comes immediately in the gospel of Luke after the appearance of Jesus to the two disciples going to Emmaus. You remember that story, they're walking, it's three days after the death of Jesus, and, and they're walking, talking about this, they're sad, and Jesus appears to them. And the reading that we have, as I said, immediate, immediately follows, but it leaves out the first part of verse 36. And the first part of verse 36 says that the, the disciples were talking about this appearance of Jesus to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, when all of a sudden he appears in the room. And so, coming off, here's this, these two disciples telling them about this incredible experience that they had, and now Jesus is there, and it's no wonder they're confused. It's no wonder they're trying to make sense of what they had just learned, and now they see Jesus, and of course they think that he's a ghost. They know the facts. Jesus died on the cross. He was laid in the tomb. And now, from that time, they learn, of course, that he's appeared to several of the disciples. And they're trying to make sense of it all. Uh, and they won't really make this association until Jesus comes back in the resurrection, in this appearance in particular, and shows them his hands and his feet. And he eats that fish in front of them. So we can understand why, in the midst of all of that, they're saying to one another, what is going on here? And Fritz and I said that to each other many times this week as we experienced this trip to Maine. What is going on? Every time someone else from the family, one of the siblings or the, the uh, estranged wife and her family came to visit, we would experience something like a play going on. You know, never any real true emotions. Um, and we would look at one another and just say, what is going on? In fact, the doctors finally could not come up with really a good reason why her father had this episode. Um, it was either a combination of the stress that the family puts on her father, you know, asking for money, stealing from him, you know, screaming obscenities at him at any point in time. Um, and, of course, he doesn't take his medications on a regular basis. I think I mentioned that already. And, and all of that together. So as we were getting ready to come back to Pennsylvania, the question that was on our minds was, what can we do before we leave to try to give some stability to this situation? And, of course, Jesus would have been thinking, what can I do with my disciples before I leave this earth? What can I do to help them understand. Once he convinced them that he, he was not a ghost, that he was the risen Jesus, he decided there were two things he would do before he left. The first thing he did was he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. The other thing he did was he gave them a mission. He said, go out to all the earth, beginning in Jerusalem, and tell them my story. Tell them to proclaim or proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins in my name. 
says, my wife and I were discussing on Thursday what we could do before we left. We decided that we had to find somebody that could be an advocate for her father. Someone who wasn't a relative. Someone who wasn't afraid to tell the rest of the family the way things should be. We realized that, you know, there was nobody in the immediate family, nobody who lives in Maine, that is, who really cares anything more about her father than getting a piece of his limited money and property. Of course, the older her father gets, the more confused he gets, the more they take advantage of him, and you just see this negative cycle that goes on and on. So in any way that we can, of course, our mission is to try to, to help bring some stability to his situation. But what can you do when you're five states away, or how much can you do, even if you are the only child who, who is not really looking for anything except a relationship? But this is the same mission that Jesus wanted for his disciples. Jesus wanted to make sure that there were people like you and me who were willing to tell his story without wanting anything from Jesus. Jesus, of course, has done everything for us that we possibly could want or need. We just have to fight the fear of what others think about us for being disciples, for being his children. Jesus is looking for people who are willing to be there to tell his story without wanting anything else. So, that's my story from this week. I can't believe it's Sunday already. I mean, it just seems like we were heading off to that 25th wedding anniversary party when uh, now it's, it's Sunday morning again. But it was our five-state, 1,300-mile journey to crazy Maine. It was a whirlwind, but it helped us to find some purpose and to clarify our mission for her father. And all that we can do is see this mission through. And my friends, Jesus has given us a mission as well. To go out, to claim, to proclaim repentance and the forgiveness of sins in his name. The question we are faced with is, will we do all that we can to fulfill His mission? Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.